Thus says the Lord, stand in the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient past. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Good evening. Good evening. You might as well remain standing. <laughs> oh, no. It's not going to start. Hold on, go ahead and sit down. <laughs> I'm a little befuffled because the COVID problems always bother me a little bit. I was a technician at one time, and uh, when equipment doesn't work right, I get befuffled. In fact, I almost said we needed a pair of exorcism. <laughs> that projector and this computer. I just do that in one of my churches on the PA system. But when Bishop Pickerton showed up, the PA system was cracking and popping, and it was long after I had left the church, but I went back for an anniversary. And he said, what's with this PA system? I said, Bishop, sometimes things don't change very much in the church. <laughs> so tonight we're going to watch a video uh, if we get it to work. Uh, it is a potter and clay video. Remember how Jeremiah, and we just had some of the words of Jeremiah here uh, on the screen. Jeremiah was called by God to go down to the potter's house. So the video is kind of self-explanatory. It isn't a happy tune video, but it is something to watch and, and to remember that God is able to renew everything. Can I 
cannot do to you as this potter has done to his clay. As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. If I announce that a certain nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down and destroyed, but then that nation renounces its evil ways, I will not destroy it as I have planned. And if I announce that I will build up and plant a certain nation or kingdom, making it strong and great, but then that nation turns to evil and refuses to obey me, I will not bless that nation as I had said I would.
remember the day that you came into our hearts and what a change that made. We also know that we want everyone else to find what we found when we invited you in. But we ask again that you would come into our heart afresh and anew, that you would open our heart tonight to receive uh, not only your word, but the message from your messenger. We pray that it will strengthen us, that it will help us grow. In that process, we continue to remember the many needs that we heard about and found out about today. We're so thankful that we can place each of those in your hands and know that you'll continue to work your perfect will in each of their lives. So as you do that, we give you thanks. And once again, I ask that you would help each of us to be open and receptive to the message that you have for us tonight. For we pray in your matchless name. And we ask again that you, as you meet our need, help us to be the one to help someone else find what we found when we invited you into our life. So we thank you in advance because we know that you're going to continue to hear and answer our prayer and you'll continue to grow your kingdom. So we thank you for all of this in the name of our Christ.
this evening. And we do want to, I do want to thank everyone who has participated in these revival services. I want to thank them for their help and their prayers and all the things that they have done. Those beautiful people. I appreciate you this evening. And, uh, I understand that there is a video that's being uh, sent out on the net. I had never looked at it yet, Jeff. I understand that they're out there, they're on my machine, and I'm afraid that if I view them, I might get hypercritical of myself. <laughs> I thank you also and everyone, and Mary Howard and many others, I'm sure. My scripture this evening is found in the uh, Psalm 85 and also uh, the uh, gospel lesson in uh, Matthew 15 verses 21 through 28. You, Lord, showed favor to your land and you restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. Restore us again, God our Savior, and put away your displeasure toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, Lord, and again grant us your salvation. I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people his faithful servants, and let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near, those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together, righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness and spring springs from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. And then from the Gospel record, the 15th chapter of Matthew, I will begin reading in verse 21. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord. She said, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you. Our Lord, our God, our Redeemer and Friend. Amen. This evening we are looking at the prayer of restoration. And there are two prayers here 
we may not always recognize the prayer that is found in Psalm 85, but it is indeed a prayer of a particular people. Now understand and know that this particular psalm, the psalmist, is a son of Korah. How many people remember who a son of Korah would be? Ah, well. Korah was involved in a rebellion against Aaron and Moses in the wilderness. And you can find that account if you peruse through the book of Numbers. He was one that wanted to go back to Egypt. He wanted to return from the way that they were because the wilderness was a tough place and Korah had led a rebellion. But now remember that Korah was a first cousin of Moses and Aaron. And so perhaps he may have had a little animosity of both against Moses and Aaron. He may have said, I should have been in charge of these people who were journeying in the wilderness to get back to their homeland. Another rebel was Dathan, and I won't go into Dathan, but here we have a prayer for restoration. And it may have been handed down from generation to generation. I can't be sure about how many generations, but I'm sure if I would have dug a little deeper, perhaps I would have found how many generations from Korah, the father, to these sons of Korah. They had years before they would come back. Um, they were and did have a position of prominence in temple worship. They were singers and they sang songs of praise in the temple. Now, these, these, this is a post-exile uh, psalm, and uh, they were talking, the, the psalmist was talking about the restoration of Israel after they had been deported to Babylon. And so, uh, it may have been that this is almost coming out of a matter of guilt on their hearts. They wanted, once again, to have a more prominent position, perhaps. Sometimes things go down through the generations, uh, and sometimes uh, it's very difficult to break away from those things. And so, sometimes in our heart of hearts, we, even today, hold grudges, don't we? Sometimes, even today, we have things that are harboring in our heart. Do we ask for restoration? Do we ask for forgiveness? In any case, these sons of Korah wrote this song down, and it is very telling. Uh, in asking God questions, will you be angry forever? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, Lord. Sometimes we might ask, will God always allow evil in the world? And I have known some people down through my lifetime, people that I have talked to. I had a first employer that said, I don't want to have anything to do with religion because I cannot believe in a God who allows evil in the world. And that problem of evil comes up once in a while in theological circles. I have to confess that sometimes even the theologians don't always have all the answers of why. Why do things happen? 
Your years ago, there was a book known as Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? But sometimes we forget who God really is and what His grace and mercy and love is all about. Out of love, some things happen that we can't understand, but God allows these things to happen so that we may learn from them. It's kind of hard to learn something new. I'm reminded of the two boys. Uh, both went to school. One was a kindergarten student, and the other one had gone to first grade. And one afternoon, when they both were home from school, the first grader came up to the kindergarten and said, don't ever learn how to spell cat. And the little boy looked at him and said, why, brother? Why shouldn't I learn how to spell cat? He said, well, after you learn to spell cat, the words get a lot harder. <laughs> <laughs> we don't always learn from what we have been taught, do we? But in any case, there's another prayer for restoration here, a story of a Shudanite woman. She was a Canaanite. And if you remember your biblical history well enough, Canaan was, they were the original inhabitants of the land that the Israelites took over. And there were things happening here in this account of the Shulamite woman, the Canaanite. It may have been that this in and of itself is a picture of God's restoration. She was desperate. Perhaps she heard something about Jesus. She had a daughter who was demon-possessed. And she didn't know probably where else to go. Perhaps they even had called upon the gods of the Canaanites, perhaps. But somehow she knew something about Jesus, for she went to Jesus and identified him. Son of David, have mercy on me. She knew that he was a son of David. Now, I don't know whether she checked his lineage or not. It may have been that she even suspected that he was the Messiah. We don't know those things that are blank in the biblical record, but we do know that she knew enough to come to Jesus, and she called out, Son of David, have mercy on me. Help me, she said. That's a prayer for restoration, isn't it? Because the Canaanites and the Israelites were in constant turmoil. They were not good friends. In fact, whenever they came into the land of Canaan, God had instructed Moses and then Joshua as he crossed the Jordan River into the promised land instructed him not to allow the inhabitants to live. And perhaps there was a lot of animosity because if your ancestors were killed off by another group, wouldn't you be a little bit missed, angry, not too happy about them? Maybe you would see them as invaders? Does that sort of look like the picture of modern day Israel? I do watch Jerusalem Dateline on CBN on a regular basis. It tells me a lot about what's going on in the Middle East and particularly the modern nation of Israel. There's a good bit of animosity out there. Anti 
anti-Semitism, if you will. This Canaanite woman decided that Jesus was someone that she needed to pursue for healing of her daughter. Demon possessed and was suffering terribly. Now here's the very interesting thing. Jesus didn't respond immediately to her crying out for help. He didn't respond. Is that the Jesus that we trust? Is that the Jesus that we have in the back of our mind? This is a very unusual encounter with a Canaanite woman. In fact, his reply was, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. So, was he being selective? Was he excluding someone? I don't know, that doesn't look like a very nice picture of Jesus, does it? But he had a purpose in mind. I personally believe that he was drawing her in, bringing her closer, rather than shouting across the roadway. She was being drawn in closer to Jesus. In fact, she fell at his feet. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall on their master's table. Now that may have been a play on the word for dog. But that word really means, in the original language, house dog or lap dog. That little thing that sits on people's glass and you can stroke them forever and they just love it. It may have been that she was placing herself beneath Jesus and saying, yes, have mercy for even the little dogs eat the crumbs under the master's table. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. What does it take for restoration? A prayer of restoration sometimes comes out of a desperate situation. We're not too happy sometimes about the circumstances that we find ourselves in. St. Teresa, in the 16th century, was stuck in some mud. And finally the saint was frustrated. And she said, if this is the way that you treat your friends, Lord, no wonder you don't have very many. <coughs> uh, no, you weren't. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes we get stuck in a mud too. And we sometimes blame God. Sometimes we blame other people, sometimes we blame God, but seldom do we ever look in the mirror and say, am I holding animosity against someone? Sometimes we have problems with people in our own homes, or perhaps even our extended family, our relatives. Sometimes we need restoration, don't we? 
Because living our life outside of God's will is not the way that God intended his salvation to be worked out, especially if we use the word and we have accepted Jesus Christ into our hearts. Sometimes we won't look at things honestly. Sometimes we get stuck in the mud, if you will. Are we blaming God tonight for the condition that we're in? Do we have to be restored to someone that has wronged us? Or we feel they have wronged us? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Jesus was in the forgiveness business. He taught his disciples how to pray for forgiveness and restoration, if you will. He himself was restoring something that had broken between two people groups in the same living in the same general vicinity of each other. He granted the request of a Shunite, a Canaanite woman. Sometimes it just is a matter of lowering ourselves and our self-pride and saying, yes, I do need to be restored to those who have wronged wrong me. In the church, sometimes there's a lot of rivalry. How good can everybody say I am? How much can I give so that everybody will know that I'm truly a strong supporter of this church? Sometimes there is rivalry. Mrs. Jones won't talk to Mrs. Smith. Are there any Smiths or Jones here? <laughs> I have to be very careful. I have had Smiths and I've had Joneses in my congregation. But sometimes it just takes years and years of animosity. And we don't always make amends and unfortunately it's some someone in that animosity dies, we don't we feel regret? Don't we feel sorrow? Aren't we ashamed of ourselves? Tonight I would like to exercise a little bit something that we can do together. I would like you to clench your fists out in front of you. <laughs> you have clenched fist? Now the clenched fist of course means that you're about ready to fight. Clenched fist. Have you ever tried to hold somebody's hand while they have a clenched fist? <laughs> oh yes, I imagine a five-year-old they want to struggle away from grandma or mother or father or grandfather. Keep that clenched fist tightly clenched. Now close your eyes for a moment. Are they closed? Now imagine the Lord has come into your presence. And he is here tonight. I would like you to open your fist now and be ready to receive Jesus. Think for a moment of those people that you feel are not worthy of your attention. Think of those people who perhaps had clenched this at you and pray for God's restoration of your life. That these broken relationships may once again 
made whole. We thank you, Lord God, for your presence with us. And we pray that now that we have open hands, that you would take us by the hand each day, that we would seek to know your will for our lives, and that you would seek to guide us in the way of restoration, in the way that would make you proud and gloryful and glorious. But we do not seek our own glory, we look for yours each day. We praise you and thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Now, if there is someone here that has not received a Savior into your heart and desires to come for prayer at the altar railing, I would invite you to come and receive Jesus tonight. If you have wandered away and you feel that you need, once again, forgiveness for doing something and saying something hurtful, perhaps to someone in your own family, perhaps to someone in the church, you can come to the altar railing for prayer. I would invite you to come during the singing of this hymn. Our hymn is Have Thine Own Way, let us stand as we sing.
give you thanks and praise for all that you have done for us, even this day. We thank you for your love and mercy that you show toward us as we have gathered in this house of prayer this evening. We know that your presence has touched each of our hearts. And we pray now that the lessons that you have taught us would go with us. That as we would make those contacts with others that we feel that have wronged us or we have wronged them, help us to make restitution and restore us once again into a right relationship with you and with each and every person that we come in contact with. I would pray that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Blessed Holy Spirit, our Comforter, our Teacher, and our Guide, be with and abide with you and all of God's children now and forever. Amen.